sex scandals, murder, and stealing your best friend's husband, which to me is like worse than murder. But let's get into it. Today, I'm going to make a gin martini. So let's work out how to do that. So before Hollywood even existed, it was basically like a patch of land. There was nothing to do there, it was boring as fuck. And it was bought up by a guy called Harvey Henry Wilcox who bought like 150 acres of land in LA. Um, but he didn't really have a vision of Tinseltown. He wanted to kind of create like a very, a very Christian community, free from prostitution, from alcohol, from drugs, from sex, from anything good. Uh, not that prostitution is good. It's very abusive industry. Yeah, he wanted this cute little Christian Mormon style community full of like happy things and farming and shit like that. The name Hollywood was actually coined by Wilson's wife who heard the name Hollywood by passersby on a train and thought, mm, love that, gonna steal it. Hence why Hollywood land was born. But the land actually got taken off. I don't know when at some point. So from the beginning of the 20th century, Hollywood became ingrained with LA. It had telephone lines, gas lines, electric lines constructed in 1910 and became a wider part of LA. So it really started to progress into this like cute little Christian town. But if it wasn't for Thomas Edison of all people, like it's so random, um, it probably could have flourished in this little Christian town and wouldn't have turned into the scandalous Hollywood that we have today. Okay, let's add some brine. Woo. Let's shake it. So yeah, back to talking shit about Thomas Edison. He invented a lot of things. He was a bit of a science nerd. And one of the things he invented was the movie camera. And because he thought he was the shit, he basically copyrighted this movie camera so no one else could copy of the idea and that caused a lot of issues within the movie industry especially for independent filmmakers so basically if they use this without his permission they would get absolutely hammered with copyright infringement lawsuits and it was so serious that Edison hired a group of like gangster mob people to scrap all these filmmakers who like violated all these laws like who knew a science sneak was capable of such violence so because Thomas Edison was a bit of a bitch boy, it became absolutely insufferable to make films on the East Coast. Therefore, Hollywood was this like ideal getaway. And in 1915, the United States versus Motion Picture Patents Co. made it possible for Hollywood to legally flourish without Thomas Edison like chasing you up uh, with loads of lawsuits and just being a dickhead. So I feel like I can't do an episode on famous Hollywood scandals without mentioning The Wizard of Oz. That movie was such a fucking hot mess. Even when I was younger, like I couldn't watch it because it gave me like icky bad vibes. Six year old me was not having it. Like I don't fuck with that. I'm gonna try that in a bit. I'm scared to try that because I love, I love, love, love martinis, but I feel like I really like messed it up so bad. For a start, the original Tin Man was called Buddy Epson and he obviously had to wear all of this like silver makeup. However, he was hospitalized from aluminium poisoning for his makeup. He apparently woke up screaming in pain from his joints and his arms and his legs and he was hospitalized for two weeks in an oxygen tent. And you'd think the studios would be like, oh my God, that's so sad. We're so sorry. Here's some compensation. Take all the time you need like whatever no they were absolute dickheads and they were like you better come back right now like right now or we'll fire you pardon me his skin literally turned blue so eventually they had to replace the actor with a guy called jack hawley and even though they'd improved the makeup he still got serious eye infections from this like aluminium i don't know what they were fucking putting in this makeup also what makes me feel really sad is the lion the tin man and the scarecrow were banished from eating lunch in the mgm cafeteria because apparently they look too scary and would put people off their food do you know what like don't give them really horrendously poisonous outfits then that will make them like disfigured okay let's try this drink mm. i like it but um no i don't no i do this sounds really rogue, but I love when martinis just literally taste of olive juice. Like I'd rather I'd rather they just literally poured me the brine in a glass and was like, there you go. So in the scene where Dorothy wakes up in a poppy field full of snow, very wholesome, very cute, wrong, the snow was asbestos. In the 1930s, it was very popular to sell asbestos as snow. It's like fake snow. I think they realized it was poisonous, but they didn't realize by how much that they didn't give a fuck. They did not give a fuck about Dorothy, about Judy Garland. 
They put her on a diet of cigarettes and black coffee to make her skinnier to fit into the childlike role of Dorothy. And they also binded her like waist and breasts to make her, you know, thinner as well. And they also give her pet pills, which was the start of her like really awful drug addiction as well. I hate MGM for this. Fuck you guys. Also to top it off, the Wicked Witch of the West, who was played by Margaret Hamilton, literally caught on fire. This was during one of her stunts and shock horror, the producers were so chill with that, they were willing to let her do the stunt again, where she almost again got caught on fire. They did not care about this, they made her friend come pick her up to go to the hospital, even though skin was literally peeling off her hands. And honestly, the breaking point for me is that her eyebrows and her eyelashes got burnt off too because my eyelashes are my whole personality. And this poor woman, she didn't even want to sue because if she did, then it would mean that she would be blacklisted from Hollywood and would never work again. So eventually when she left hospital and recovered, she was made to wear green gloves because the nerves were showing on her hands still. It's disgusting. And she got no compensation for that. Let's have another drink. I'm going to need another drink for this one because this one's just fucked up. So while it's no surprise that Hollywood is full of absolute nonces, this guy called Jerry Lee Lewis is absolutely no exception. He was a rising star in the 50s. He was compared to Elvis in terms of talent. He was the new like it person, one to be watching out for. And his downfall was when he decided to do a press tour in the UK and it was actually revealed that he'd married his cousin, which isn't even the worst part. It's not even. So basically a reporter in London went up to his cousin and was like, who the fuck are you? And she was like, I'm his wife. And they were like, okay. And then they found out she was 13 years old. 13, one, three, 13 years old. So obviously the press had like a field day with this as they should. And he was basically like ostracized. And he got married a further six times after that. He was on his Henry VIII era. I hate him though, like that is so, why would you marry a child? Like what do you see in a 13 year old girl? So the next story involves a Hollywood actress, a violent gangster boyfriend and a very fatal stabbing. So Johnny Sampanato was a notorious gangster and was involved in a Chicago mob. He eventually made his way to Hollywood and started dating like the most beautiful actress called Lana Turner and she was at the height of her career at this point. So Lana and Johnny had this very toxic relationship that was plagued by jealousy and fights and they were constantly on and off all the time until this one fatal argument. On the 4th of April, 1958, an argument broke out in Lana's home. And according to Lana's accountant, Johnny had been fatally stabbed by Lana with a kitchen knife in self-defense after Johnny was being super abusive towards her. And shortly he died after his wounds, which is what he deserved. But <clears throat> The case was very highly publicized and there were rumors that Lana had killed Johnny in cold blood. However, her version of events were very much supported by the court and the evidence found at the scene. The verdict was only reached in one day and Lana was acquitted of all charges, girl boss. But the story did and then there were rumors that Johnny actually had ties to the mob so the murder was actually orchestrated by them and it was framed as a fight between Lana and Johnny. Some people actually believe that Lana's daughter called Cheryl Crane actually murdered Johnny however she was 14 at the time so that was quickly put to bed. Yeah it's very hard to say what the truth actually is but it's a very good scandal, very awful. I would kick off, I would expose them all, I would literally light a house on fire but never mind. Anyway so before I get into that Elizabeth Taylor is one of the most iconic actresses of our time. She starred in Cleopatra, Cat on a Hot Tin Roof, whatever. She was great, she was beautiful, Okay. And she was very close friends with the American actor and singer, Eddie Reynolds, and his wife, who was starred singing in the rain, Debbie Reynolds. They were pretty much like a Hollywood it couple, and they had two children, one being Carrie Fisher from Star Wars. They had it all together. They were in love, allegedly. So Elizabeth was really good friends with the couple, and unfortunately, her partner, Mike, died in this awful plane crash in 1958. And at the time, Debbie Reynolds was taking care of the children. Therefore, Eddie went over to comfort Elizabeth. And you know where it's gonna go. They ended up having this full blown affair. And it wasn't even like a quick shag and then I'll get back to my wife. He left Debbie Reynolds for Elizabeth and Debbie had to literally bring up the two children on her own. And only a year later after this plane crash incident, Eddie and Elizabeth Taylor got married and basically left Debbie 
to just get by. Speaking in 1983, Debbie said she actually never felt bitter about Elizabeth or the whole situation. I don't know how she does that. She's either a doormat or the nicest person alive because if that was me, if my best friend not only fucked my husband behind my back, but also married him like a year later, shit would hit the fan. I would burn down some houses. Like, I don't, I don't know. But honestly, props to her for not even holding a grudge because I still hold a grudge like 10 years later. Like the people that bullied me when I was 11, do I still sort their Facebook? Yes, I do. <laughs> Ooh. I need to stop, I need to learn how to make nice drinks. Mm. So to point out the obvious, Hollywood was full of drama, troubled stars, on and off set. So particularly in the case of actresses, once they'd signed their life away, they were bound by a four to seven year contract with one studio in particular. So unlike today where actors kind of are freelance and they can choose which studio they want to make a film with, back in the day they were signed to one studio and that studio would typecast them in roles. And if that wasn't sexy enough, they also controlled every aspect of the actresses or actors' lives. And these included things like arranged marriages, abortion, studio prescribed pills, murder, like, you know, the ones. So stars such as Clark Gable and Greta Garbo were worth absolutely millions to these studios, so they couldn't afford to have bad press for either of these actors. And this is just like a, an example of two. So basically, if the audiences knew that Clark Gable had a dared to have an illegitimate child or worse, um, was part of a hit and run where someone died. They obviously wouldn't want to watch his films, which is fair enough for the hit and run thing. But if they knew that Credit Garbo was secretly a bisexual, oh my God, scandal, they also would riot and be like, I'm not watching her anymore. So how did they even cover it up? They hired these people called fixers. And one of the most famous of these fixers was a guy called Eddie Manning. And if you've seen the 2016 film, Hail Caesar, you'll know exactly who I'm talking about. And honestly, Eddie's list of fixers were absolutely reprehensible from worsening Judy Garland's drug addiction to forcing people to have abortions. It was just, he was involved in a murder. It was just fucking horrendous. Yeah, he even personally helped to recover the badly burned remains of megastar Carol Lombard when she died in a plane crash in 1942. So to elaborate on the murders, he's actually been linked to his wife's Ting's murder, who was called George Reeves, and he was the original Superman. And this has honestly been like an unsolved true crime story for decades now. It's pretty obvious who did it, but technically it's unsolved. He reportedly died by his own hand, but many find that very, very hard to believe, especially since his affair with Mannix's wife had only ended like days or weeks before this alleged suicide. In addition to the really sus fact that he killed himself naked, he also had bruising on his face and neck and also showed no signs whatsoever of being suicidal. And you know what, like I'm not claiming to be a criminology girly here, but the fact that the coroners washed his body before the autopsy is kind of a bit sus to me. It kind of gives the police were bribed vibes. They also failed to test for powder on Reeves' hand. And even though the top of Reeves' skull was removed, no one checked the head wound for gunpowder traces, which would have been evident if he'd like shot himself in the head. Another less awful story was one that was kept for 65 years. So apparently Loretta Young had an affair with Clark Gable on the set of The Call of the Wild. The affair ended up with Loretta getting pregnant, which was obviously like a huge taboo back then. So this is where Mannix comes in and he arranged this huge cover up where Loretta went to Europe for 19 months and returned with a baby. Oh my God, who'd have thought that? However, the twist is that she found this baby in Europe and decided to adopt her. And she only told the truth to her daughter called Judy Lewis when she turned 23. Another way studios controlled their stars and their images was through powerful poison pens of gossip columns, most notably Hedda Hopper, former actress and Luella Parsons and their careers were absolutely dependent of information given to them by studio. And examples of their handiwork include Hopper's frequent negative coverage of Charlie Chaplin over his politics, his controversial paternity suit, and his marriage to an 18 year old when he was 54. It's giving Leonardo DiCaprio. Her work contributed to Chaplin being prevented from entering the United States in 1952. This is, I hate this because I love Casablanca, but Parsons actually contributed to ruining Ingrid Bergman's career for a very long time when she exposed her affair while she was married to Roberto Rossellini. But jokes on her because she actually 
divorced and got married to Roberto, even though they got divorced. Honestly, this is just like a teeny, teeny, tiny fraction of what actually goes on in Hollywood today. Accountability was nowhere to be found. Again, just like today, shock. Yeah, I don't really know what else to say apart from everyone sucks in Hollywood. Stop idolizing Hollywood icons apart from Debbie Reynolds. 